All right, you guys, welcome to this week's episode. I'm here with Dr. Anthony J. He is up in Minnesota at the Rochester uh, Mayo Clinic, and apparently there's a storm there, and right outside of my window, they're playing xylophones, so we'll see how the audio goes on this episode, but we're excited to be talking about estrogens and the changing face of hormones for people in our society today with all of these new toxins. So thanks for being here, man. I'm stoked to talk to you. Ah, thanks for having me. It's great to hang out at Paleo FX recently too. Yeah, it was good to meet you there. What? Let me ask you this before we get into the estrogen stuff. What did you think was your favorite part of Paleo FX? Was there a particular talk or a product you saw? Yeah, um, <laughs> man, there's so much good stuff there. I was really impressed. That's my first time I've ever been there. I couldn't believe how many people were there. It was just aston astonishing how huge it was. My favorite part for sure was when Ben Greenfield was giving his keynote talk and then he threw that plastic bottle down off the stage. <laughs> and then I, I went and rummaged around and found a San Pellegrino glass bottle and carried it up to him on stage. And he, he was making a big scene of that. It was pretty funny. So he threw the plastic bottle down on stage because he was saying, I don't want to drink this water in the plastic bottle. Is that the idea? And we're going to talk yeah. about that kind of stuff today. Exactly. We're going to talk about how <laughs> there are these xenoestrogens and plastics that are contributing to changing hormonal levels and lower levels of testosterone. So that's cool. There was this uh, acupressure mat that I've talked about a lot. I have no affiliation with them, but it was a bunch of little spikes. Did you see mm -hmm. that? Oh, yeah. On was, the feet. Yeah. Yeah you, just, pad. yeah. you could like stand on it. And yeah. I have one now and it, it's very, it's very cool. I think it's just that little bit of pain kind of centers me and, and it nice. just gets me to kind of be in the moment and deep breathing. So that was cool. Did you go to Barton Springs while you were there? No, is that that ice? Is that ice cold water or is it warm? Yeah. I saw it's, pictures of you. Yeah, it's 68 degrees. It's so it's just like okay. That's not not bad. ice cold, but it's an amazing spot. So if people are listening to this and they've been to Austin or they're going to Austin, you've got to go to Barton Springs. It's mm. amazing. It's this huge spot spring fed pool there's no chemicals and there's these big grassy knolls where you can go and get sun anyway all right oh yeah i'm gonna i'll probably go there i'm gonna be at the uh the keto keto, keto con, con? i guess it's called yeah nice and so i'll probably and that's back in austin uh-huh and i think i'm gonna be in austin again in the fall for another conference i'm speaking at but yeah it's so i'll definitely hit the hit the the, what is it called? Barton? Barton Springs. Yeah, Barton we'll go Springs. together. We'll go together. Okay. I'm gonna, okay, good. I'm going to be a keto con as well in June. Perfect. So okay. People can come out and meet both of us there. So, <laughs> so let's talk, let's talk about estrogenic compounds, man. Basically the idea here, and the reason I wanted to have you on is because what I see in my clinical practice is that testosterone levels in men are plunging precipitously and women are experiencing a lot of endocrine hormonal disruption as well. And I think that no small part of this is our increasing exposure to these exogenous estrogenic compounds in the environment, whether it's from food, from mold, from plastics, from pesticides. We're going to talk about all of it. But it's a really scary thing for me as a man. And then I think it's also scary for women who are worried about getting exposed to excess estrogens. So how did you become interested in this? You study epigenetics, which you can tell us about. It's kind of this modification of the genetic code, but how did you get interested in this whole thing and, and where did this story start for you? Yeah, it started way back in college because on my orientation week in Florida, I went to college in Florida, <clears throat> and they said, look, we're at sea level. They brought in somebody from the city and said, look, we're at sea level. People are urinating birth control into the water supply and then it gets recycled, but nobody's filtering out the water supply. So make sure you filter your water. That's what they said. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And, and I'd never heard anything like this. This was a long time ago. <clears throat> and this blew my mind that that people are drinking birth control. I mean, it's low levels, but still it was it just seemed completely disgusting. And of course that put it on my radar. And then I started as I went through my you know, all my scientific training, even my PhD where I studied hormones and cholesterol and fats. I, it was just on my radar and I was realizing it's, it goes way beyond birth control. It's, it's all these plastics, you know, these herbicides, these pesticides, they're in the water supply <clears throat> and activated charcoal. I used to use activated charcoal in research in the lab and it does an awesome job removing hormones. So you can get them out. It's not that hard, but the city is not good at it. The municipal water supply, they're good at killing bacteria. They're good at killing things with chemicals, but they're not pulling they're not pulling these hormone mimicking molecules out of the water. So that's really what got me going on it. That's a scary thing. And I, 
talk to most of my clients about the quality of their drinking water. And we can get into that a little bit, but I think for most people, I mean, I don't know how many people listening to this are just drinking water straight out of the tap, but I think most people kind of have the sense that they need to have some filtration system on their water, but perhaps people are, you know, in a city where they've been told, quote unquote, the water here is really good, you know, like it's really good water. But even in places like that, where they have the quote unquote cleanest water and it's, oh, you can drink it straight out of the tap. It's really good water. The municipal systems here, the cities are not filtering these steroid hormone molecules. And so we can get exposed to small doses, even from our water supply. And it's really important for people to be aware of the quality of their water. And I think like you highlighted, they're small doses, but hormones circulate in the body in small doses. I mean, as you know, estrogen is measured in nanograms per liter in the body and testosterone similarly, you know, these are microscopic quantities. It doesn't take a whole lot. And this idea that we're putting more estrogens and progesterones into the population by using birth control pills, women are then depositing them into the sewer systems and there's more estrogen in our water than there should be. There shouldn't really be any. And then we can consume this. This is such a crazy concept. So if we're just thinking about water, what do you do? What should people do to like purify their water to avoid these estrogenic compounds in the water? Yeah, for sure. I I mean, I definitely recommend activated charcoal. Sometimes they call it carbon. So Mm -hmm. they kind of throw you off with the marketing, but it's gotta be, you gotta have activated charcoal and I avoid plastic bottles. I mean, there's definitely enough leaching and it's, it's exactly what you said. It's in the nanogram levels, which sounds really tiny, but I mean, men's natural estrogen is about 20 nanograms per liter. We're already in the nanogram level in the nanogram range. So as soon as you start drinking a thousand nanograms per liter of phthalates in these plastic bottles stored at room temperature, I mean, it's having an impact and it's not an immediate impact. It, it tricks your body because your body kind of thinks, oh, this is a natural hormone, right? So you don't get bloating, you don't get a headache, you don't get weird immediate symptoms usually with these estrogen chemicals because they're subtle. You know, they're not, your body doesn't perceive them as poison. It takes a lot. I mean, like even BPA is another good example. It takes a lot of BPA to kill cells. I mean, tons of it. So then, you know, that threw scientists off for a long time because they thought, well, it's not really toxic. You know, it doesn't kill the cells. So people have been on this thing that, that like the dose makes the poison. That's what you hear all the time in research and they're training doctors to think that way. It's dose makes the poison. But now that we understand epigenetics, that's not really true. I mean, if you can have these super, super low doses of these estrogen mimicking chemicals and yeah, they're not poisonous, but they are in a certain way because they're causing long-term health impacts, including lowering testosterone. I mean, it is rampant for sure. I see it in my practice as well with all my consulting clients. I mean, the first thing you have to do is you have to avoid these estrogen chemicals. You have to get them out of your system, get them out of your water, get them out of your food. And then, you know, your your testosterone usually starts to go up right away when you avoid the chemicals. That's a really striking thing. And I want to highlight that, that as I mentioned early on, in our conversation, a lot of the men I see have low testosterone. And I think that we are handing out testosterone replacement therapy as physicians way too quickly. And this is so, this is a theme that I come back to over and over in my clinical practice and in the stuff that I talk about. I don't think Western medicine does a great job at asking what the root cause of many of these things is. I think that we are told too often by the Western medical paradigm that it's just part of natural aging, that you're a guy, you're going to get menopause or you're a woman, you're a woman, you know, you're going to have, you know, unnatural levels of estrogen. It's okay. It's just part of the natural aging process. Our hormones are going to get messed up. And I think that's, that's just baloney, you know, like this doesn't have to happen in the same way. Sure. There's going to be some changes as we age. We're not going to look the same at 55 as we did at 20, but the idea that men's hormones, especially testosterone, whether it's free or total or testosterone precursors or testosterone, you know, products like DHT, dihydrotestosterone, the idea that these irrevocably or unavoidably decline with age is just not consistent with what I've seen in my practice. There are men who do certain things like avoiding plastics, avoiding estrogenic foods, all the things we're going to talk about that don't seem to always have this this pattern where their estrogen levels go up and their testosterone levels drop. And so I just want people to know that that is not an unavoidable consequence. And what Anthony's talking about here is really important to think about. And the sources are generally 
the, the water we drink, the plastics that we're exposed to, the food. And in the food, we're talking about actual plants that are estrogenic. We'll get into that. We're talking about pesticides that are sprayed on plants, which can have an estrogenic role. Mm -hmm. And then molds on food, which you've mm -hmm. talked about before, that can mimic estrogen. So just to back up for a moment so people understand what we're talking about, we're talking about molecules that mimic estrogen. Now, estrogen is this hormone that <coughs> both men and women have in their bodies. Women obviously have much higher levels of estrogen. Men have higher levels of testosterone, but both men and women have both of those hormones. And both of those hormones get metabolized to different types of sort of derivatives of estrogen and testosterone. But the idea here is that our bodies keep those hormones in very delicate ranges and when we start taking in exogenous or exterior sources of estrogen or even androgens, which is seemingly more rare, um, at least from environmental sources, that can really throw out this delicate balance. And you bring up this great point. We don't notice it. It's just very subtle. It's declining testosterone or the effects of declining testosterone from things like plastic water bottles or plants. So let's dig into the plastics a little bit because I think people aren't so much aware of this. We talked a little bit about the drinking water and you said use a carbon or activated carbon filter. I've heard you say, do you still use a Berkey filter? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. I also use reverse osmosis too. <clears throat> okay. So I think that just the take home with regard to water is don't drink tap water. <laughs> yeah. Filter it, filter it somehow, filter it in the best way possible through an activated carbon or charcoal filter. A Berkey is a really good one. It's B-E-R-K-E-Y. There's no affiliation, but that's one of the ones I've used in the past. Reverse osmosis is great. With reverse osmosis, you probably have to remineralize it, that's, or you, yeah, or you can get, or you can get spring water that's you know beneath the bedrock of the earth and isn't exposed to these things and isn't part of a municipal water supply. So what's the deal with plastics? You know why did Ben Greenfield throw the plastic water bottle down? I mean, it's <laughs> it's so funny because like everywhere I go, people hand me plastic water bottles, right? And I'm yeah, just like, yeah, yeah. I don't want it. So what's yeah, going yeah. on with that? Well, it's convenience for one and it's marketing for another, right? They didn't used to sell water because everybody, you know, just said, well, why the hell would I buy water? It's free. But now it's this big push, you know, everybody's buying water. And a lot of it is because they recognize that the municipal water is pretty nasty. I mean, not only is there estrogen chemicals, there's pharmaceutical drugs and some other things that are also nasty. And so people try and solve that problem by buying bottled water but then it's full of phthalates you know and it's especially plastic number one usually you look on the bottom and it has a little recycling symbol and it has a number one inside the symbol that's polyethylene tera phthalate phthalate being the key word because phthalates are molecules that act like estrogen just like bpa so even if it's bpa free and that's been kind of the red herring everybody's talking about oh it's bpa free so it's okay but in reality, usually they've replaced BPA-free bottles with phthalate plastics or BPS or BPF or BPAF. There's all these BPA analogs. So bisphenol A is BPA, but you can make bisphenol S. You can make literally just about any alphabet soup you want with bisphenols, just A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And it's just purely manipulating the chemistry a little tiny bit. So you legally don't have to call it BPA. So you can say BPS, that's probably the most common one. And they've done studies on a number of these quote unquote analogs, these molecules that are similar to BPA, and all of them come back at least as estrogenic. Some of them are more estrogenic, so they're even worse for you, but at least, at least you can call your bottle BPA free, right? And I mean, that, that goes, you know, like people go through people's fridge. It's full of these plastics. You got all these containers, plastic, plastic, plastic. And then you look at the soda cans, the aluminum cans are lined with plastic. A lot of people don't realize that, but I mean, you know, otherwise you get aluminum toxicity because that bioaccumulates that builds up in your body, just like these estrogens. And that's a whole other point. Actually, I, I forgot to mention earlier is that <clears throat> these things build up in your body. So you go back to toxicity, you know, so X amount, you know, a certain amount of grams kills you, right? A certain amount of grams, that's a mountain of this stuff. But you take these nanogram levels and then you have some more the next day and the next day and the next day and that starts to build up inside your fat cells. And pretty soon you do have a dose that's, you know, on the borderline of killing cells within that certain vicinity. So 
you know, it's better to avoid these whenever you can. And then, yeah, once in a while you're traveling and you need to get a plastic bottle, then it's okay because you don't have all this crap building, you know, building up in your fat cells. It's, it's funny for me as the guy who wrote the book on this, you know, I go and I get a plastic bottle once in a while. You have to, right? I mean, that's, that's the only option in a lot of cases. And I kind of feel guilty because, you know, people like walking around at Paleo FX or something, you know, as a public figure who's against plastic, you know, you almost have to just do it on principle, but I'm okay. Like I say, in rare exceptions to get a plastic bottle, but for goodness sake, don't have them every day, get stainless steel, get glass. Yeah, I think you're right. It's about cumulative exposure. And if we gradually decrease our cumulative exposure or pick off little things here and there, we can overall affect a decrease in our estrogenic load. And I think, like you said, I love it. It's plastic water bottles, which people are, are not aware of anymore because we've been told it's BPA free. Well, that's just, a, that's just a misdirection. That's a sleight of hand, in my opinion. I think you'd agree with that, that plastic is plastic. And some plastics are more estrogenic than others because of these phthalates, which are spelled P-H. Um, so P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so people have heard about phthalates. And so, you know, just people, I want them to realize that all plastics have estrogenic compounds in them. And we really, as humans have never evolutionarily been exposed to plastic before. And so it's a really bad thing for humans to be exposed to. Um, It's a really dangerous thing. And so, like you said, it's the inside of soda cans. It's the inside of sparkling water cans. It's the inside of soup cans and canned food or canned fish or any of these things and even canned sardines, you know, and again, it's pretty much impossible to avoid it completely, but I want people to be aware that these exposures are pervasive. And so, in terms of that, I think you offer some great solutions. Stainless steel water bottle, glass water bottles in terms of water, and just not being exposed to the plastics. The one place that I, I am like militant about plastics, but you know, in the food chain, it's basically impossible to avoid because I get steaks, you know, whether I get steaks from ButcherBox or another company or whatever, like they come in plastic, you know? I know, I know it's frustrating. I, 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 wish they would, I wish they would move away from that. And you know what I do actually just on that note is I, I know my farmer, I buy a whole cow, I buy have two chest freezers. So that way when one of them is empty, I unplug it. But I hunt also, so there's that. But even when I'm hunting and when I talk to my butcher and my farmer who raises my cows without any chemicals, he just lets them roam around and then just literally butchers them. I tell him, don't use any plastic, use butcher paper, use the stuff that's coated with uh, silicone paper, you know. Um, So you can even do, you know, if you're really careful, you can even do better with the meat. And it's actually cheap because the farmer I know, I mean, he doesn't, there's no middleman. He doesn't charge me an arm and a leg. He's really, really reasonable. Um, but yeah, but in those little, little exposures, again, not that big of a deal because it's just a little bit of surface contact where you really get into trouble is the liquids, especially the oils. A lot of people are storing oil in plastic and you get a lot more leaching in with the oils. And then they do these animal studies with those oils and they blame the oils on all the health problems that are what, what do you know? The health problems are exactly the same as you see when you just add those estrogen chemicals. Ah, uh, that's interesting. That is interesting. Yeah, but that's a good point that, you know, sterile molecules, steroid backbone molecules are fat soluble. So storing things that are oily are going to get more of the BPA. So like a can of sardines in olive oil, that's going to have more BPA in the olive oil or even, you know, when I was recently in Los Angeles, I had cod liver for the first time and it was in a tin and it was in cod liver oil, but that's going to have more of those things in the oil. So just, you know, it's impossible to avoid it completely. I wish, I'm hoping in the future I can get meat that's sourced without having touched plastic. But for right now, a lot of the meat that I get is stored in plastic for some amount of time. And I I just, I can't, it's just impossible to avoid. It's one of those hard things. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about plants a little bit because this is interesting to me. You know, I'm, I'm really interested in carnivorous diets and animal-based diets and the idea that plants even have estrogen mimetic compounds, which we would call phytoestrogens, is something that many people may be familiar with in the case of soy, but there are lots of these. So tell us a little bit about phytoestrogens and where, not even, we're not even talking about plastics now. These are just plants that have estrogen mimetic compounds in them. What should we be thinking about? Right. Well, they did a study with over 100 foods and... You know, again, just just so people have a relative number, I mean, 
I don't want to get too much into the units, but they were just looking at plant estrogen, just looking at phytoestrogen. And every plant was under 1,000 micrograms of these estrogens, except soy and flax. Soy and flax were over 100,000. All right, so all the plants under 1,000, soy and flax over 100,000 in terms of just the phytoestrogens. So soy and flax are the big concern uh, if you're really trying to dose up on estrogen. I mean, dose up on soy and flax, but if you want to avoid estrogens, those are the two big ones. Marijuana smoke, like cannabis smoke also acts like estrogen and so does lavender essential oil. Um, but again, you know, so like if you're a teenager or something like that, you have to be more careful because your hormones are developing, your stem cells are developing for these things. But soy and flax, I mean, just far and above everything else. And then the other time you oftentimes see estrogenic issues from plant compounds is when people isolate the compounds and take them as supplements, like resveratrol is a good example, um, or literally any other flavonoid. There's 5,000 flavonoids at least. And you know, they all act like estrogen to some degree. If you really dig into it, you know, look at the chemical structures and it's real similar to estrogen. So it doesn't surprise me that whenever they study them, in their isolated form, they usually do act like estrogen. And none of them act like testosterone, as far as I know. I mean, <laughs> our estrogen, they call the estrogen receptor promiscuous. You know, it's a lot more promiscuous. It's happy to bind all these fake estrogen chemicals because it's, it's more readily receptive to that. And it's more readily receptive to being, you know, bastardized by these chemicals and by these plant chemicals. I love that you mentioned resveratrol because one of the things that I constantly talk about when I'm on podcasts and in my social media is the idea that so many of these plant molecules like resveratrol or curcumin, I mean, let's just talk about resveratrol, have been held up as panacea, you know, and really that's not the case that many of these plant molecules are actually doing really negative things in the human body. And if you look at the studies of resveratrol, it's generally failed to have efficacy in human studies. And resveratrol is this molecule that's from wine, right? And people were saying, oh, it's gonna extend longevity. And in, in rodents, it does seem to activate the sirtuin-1 family of genes. Now, interestingly, you can also activate the sirtuin-1 family of genes by being in a ketogenic state. So it's not a unique effect. But if you look at studies of resveratrol, it also decreases androgen precursors. There are specific studies that we can point to to show that levels of DHEA and other androgen precursors decline when they give resveratrol. And then also with resveratrol, some of these other collateral damaging effects are potentially triggering autoimmunity with uh, uh, alterations to the T helper 17 cell lines in the human body. So it's a big deal. Like these plant molecules, I love that you said this, 5,000 flavonoids which are, we are constantly told that they are good for us and that people want to take them in isolation. And they all, like you're saying, could potentially trigger estrogenic responses in the human body. And, you know, interestingly, there are some studies, there's actually a study that I've talked about before. I talked about this when I was on the podcast with Ben Greenfield. There's a study in which they removed all flavonoids from people's diet. It's a study where they were actually looking to see what the effect of green tea catechin was. I can link to it in the show notes. But when they, were, when they created a flavonoid-free diet, which was basically a fruit and vegetable deprivation diet, what they saw was improvement in markers of oxidative stress and DNA damage. This is really, it was, it was just really wildly surprising to these researchers, but when they eliminated all flavonoids, oxidative stress was decreased and people had less DNA damage. And I know we're talking about the estrogenic role of these compounds, but I think many people believe these flavonoids to be super valuable and they're actually probably hurting us or messing with our hormones. Now, what are some other flavonoids that you're thinking of, uh, other plant pigments? What should people be thinking of in terms of these flavonoids? What are other examples of flavonoids? Oh man, there's so many of them. I mean, uh, there's one called apigenin um, that a lot of people are taking for anti-aging purposes as well. And again, you go to the research and it's sure enough, it's estrogenic. I think Dave Asprey was taking that. He may still be taking it. And then he realized it's, it's, it's a mitochondrial damaging it's damaging mitochondria and it's acting like estrogen. Oops. You know, I mean, so I, I feel like it's not which ones are acting like estrogens. It's like which ones aren't and you can't really find them. So what I would suggest if people really want to take those supplements, use the search term estrogen and then whatever flavonoid you're, you're looking into. And it, again, if there's no research, if there's never been a study, I would assume it's estrogenic. And if there has been a study, it's, 
for the most part, it comes back as an estrogen mimicking molecule. So there's kind of a yin yang with a lot of those. They have some benefits, but then that estrogen impact kind of offsets a lot of the benefits in a lot of cases. So we're talking about molecules like quercetin, right? Quercetin yeah. has been shown to have estrogenic activity, apigenin or apigenin. What about lycopene? Because isn't that, I guess it's carotenoid. I'm just trying to think of the molecules so people will know because right. people are taking so many of these molecules and I want people to be aware of which ones are flavonoids, but people could just look up flavonoids and there's just so many of them and they are, they are estrogenic. Is, is apigenin or apigenin the one that's derived from pomegranate peel? Um, I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know. I've heard. Uh, I am going to look up my list. I do have kind of an ongoing list. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Just let's just put the, let's put the, the top 10 most wanted up there because quercetin, I mean, when I was on the podcast with Ben Greenfield, he was like, what about quercetin? And I was like, quercetin is estrogenic. You know, <laughs> like yeah. why do people want to take this? I think that people don't understand that these plant molecules are not made for humans and they often have these other roles. Right. It's all furafane, definitely at high doses can act like estrogen. Oh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm like the man, I am the sulforaphane anti-crusader. I am on a mission to like burn sulforaphane at the stake. I'm, I'm just totally interested in taking that molecule down. I mean, we know sulforaphane has tons of other negative effects and if people have listened to other stuff I've talked about, they'll hear about sulforaphane, which is derived from glucoraphanin when right. it combines with myrosinase. And it's this compound that's touted by people like Rhonda Patrick, who I respect, but I think that she's hurting people by recommending these huge doses of sulforaphane. Um, so do you have a list? Yeah. Did you find it? Well, I, I, I didn't because I have to look through so many folders, but I did <laughs> find my, I do have an, like an estrogen list for postmenopausal women. Mm -hmm. And I do want people to know, like, there's a difference between estrogen receptor alpha and beta. So like if you take testosterone or something, you've got an androgen receptor. So your androgen receptor binds testosterone. There's just one of them. But if you've got estrogen, there's two receptors. There's two things that can pick it up. There's alpha and there's beta, estrogen receptor alpha, estrogen receptor beta. And alpha has a lot of problems. If you start activating that alpha receptor, you see things like depression and breast cancer and all kinds of fertility issues. And again, most of the uh, flavonoids will activate that estrogen receptor alpha. And that's the risk with a lot of these artificial estrogens period, right? Like the phthalates, the BPA, the mole toxin. But then if you start looking just for beta, you know, then you start seeing like licorice root just at high doses will activate preferentially activate the beta. So I have like a list for that. There's one called equal, which is a soy breakdown product. So the problem with soy, right, is it's activating alpha and beta, but then as it gets broken down, there's one little, product you can take that just activates the beta so there's there can be unique contexts where people can take these with a target you know a specific goal in mind because they've already messed up their estrogen so bad through all these other artificial estrogen chemicals you know there's certain situations where people can use these i think to to benefit their health but it's so limited it's almost like i said it's almost like which ones don't harm you that's more you know <laughs> Like that's, that restricts the, li the list from 5,000 down to just a few in real specific situations. Yeah. I mean, this, you know, from my perspective there, you know, we have to be really careful with these plant compounds, really careful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I like what you said that the big ones are flax and soy. And, you know, I was recently on a podcast with Rich Roll and he was talking about how, you know, he can get enough omega-3 from alpha linolenic acid and a lot of people use alpha linolenic acid from soy or from, wow. from flax. But it's like, you know, to do the flax is to really put yourself in danger of getting lots of these phytoestrogens. And yeah. soy is another huge source and soy has many other issues with it as well. It's often right. entirely so, gen so, genetically so did modified. Rich, did Rich bring you on his podcast? No, I went on a podcast called The Minimalists and we sort of had a friendly uh -huh. debate. Yeah, Rich Roll <laughs> would never bring me on his podcast. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, maybe, who knows? I'm, even, I'm not, you know, I've been invited to go on a few vegan podcasts and then they find out more about me and then they reject their initial <laughs> invitation. <laughs> they rescind the invitation. I always wonder about that. I haven't had that happen yet, but I'm sure it'll happen at some point in the future. Say, well, you, oh. probably, you probably just won't get invited to begin with, but I've even gotten invited, like I said, because initially it's like, oh, this estrogen, but then they realize you know, I'm not against, I'm, a, I'm totally against soy and most of the vegans and vegetarians just prop up soy like it's the miracle superfood. 
Why would it be, right? It's such a big deal, right? So flax and soy, and then the flavonoids, and I love that you highlighted this idea that these compounds taken in in isolation are often at very high doses and can be especially estrogenic. And I, I love that we could um, that we could piss on the resveratrol campfire a little bit because I always like to highlight how uh, that molecule is not the panacea that people believe it is. So, all right, well, let's talk a little bit about um, the mold toxins, these like mycoestrogens on grains. So again, we're just going deeper and deeper in this rabbit hole. People just buckle up. So tell me about these mold toxins. Yeah, it's a perfect transition because you go from these soy products and these grains and you, and most of them in America are stored in these giant silos and these big facilities. It's become more and more industrialized, bigger and bigger. And so they end up with a lot of mold and they just kind of cut their losses and say, here's the, here's the legally allowable limit. And it's just going to end up being mixed into everything else. And boom, there you go. So in America, that legal allowable limit for mold toxin is really high. And for estrogen, they don't even have a legal allowable limit. They don't even regulate how much mold estrogen is in your food. Whereas in the UK, they do regulate it. And then in Europe, they regulate it even tighter. And what's really interesting, if you look just at the obesity rates, right? Europe has a lot less. The UK is less, but it's not as much as Europe. And then America is all over the place in terms of obesity. Um, so, you know, that's an indicator at least that these mold estrogens are probably playing a role along with all these other chemicals that we allow to be legal that Europe has, you know, already made illegal 10 plus years ago in many cases. Even like, China has stricter regs on some of these chemicals. Like glyphosate. Yeah, exactly. And atrazine, atrazine, totally illegal in Europe. You know, zero is allowed in the drinking water. In America, they allow 3,000 nanograms per liter in the drinking water for atrazine. atrazine. Yeah. And atrazine is a uh, herbicide, uh, an herbicide that's used on corn mainly, right? Correct. Yeah. But they put it on wheat as well sometimes and some other grains. I, I was interviewing a farmer when I was writing my book um, and he said, oh, I love atrazine. He says, I love it. And he goes, I especially spray it down in the boggy areas because it stays, the, the glyphosate washes out real easily, but the, but the atrazine sticks in there and it stays there a lot longer in the wetlands, right? In the wet areas. And what's really crazy about atrazine, and I, I know I'm getting away from mold, but I'll swing back to mold in a minute. But if you put a frog in water that has atrazine at 200 nanograms per liter, right now 3,000 is allowed in our drinking water. You put a frog in 200 and it changes a male frog into a female. The males turn into a female. And scientists call it male feminization. They're real honest about it in the actual scientific research. And then you kind of, some of them are kind of politicizing it and saying it's gonad reproductive abnormalities or they're kind of like making up these euphemisms for male feminization. But what's, you know, what's crazy, I can't resist telling you about this study on atrazine. They had two groups of rats and they gave them exactly the same calories, exactly the same everything. But in one of them, the drinking water, they put low dose atrazine. It wasn't even high dose, low dose. And that group got fat. So just from the atrazine, right? And then you throw in these mold toxins and these soy estrogens and these plastics, right? But back to the mold toxin, a lot of people realize mold has toxins, right? Black mold, you put on the these big hazmat suits and these respirators and you go in and you remediate your mold. One of the reasons you have to do that is because mold secrete a toxin called xerolenone. That's Z-E-A, xerolenone. Um, and that acts like estrogen in your body. That's why it's so damn toxic because it's disrupting your natural hormones. And it, you know, it causes animals, even animals that are eating moldy grains, they go into weird like, you know, estrus cycles and weird fertility issues. And again, it's hard to quantify depression. But as soon as they started using atrazine over in India, suicide rates skyrocketed. I think it's still just like a huge national emergency over there among the farming community, how many suicides they have. Um, so, you know, and that's a common thing you see with all these estrogen chemicals. You start disrupting estrogen. It's like post-menopause, right? Or excuse me, well, post-menopause too, maybe, but I'm thinking of postpartum, right? A woman has a baby, estrogen gets whacked up, and then sometimes she has depression. And people are flipping that switch with these artificial estrogens and causing depression. And again, it's the fat gains, you know, it's like being pregnant. When a woman is pregnant, her body stores more fat. It's a, an efficient storage form for energy. You're flipping that switch with these artificial estrogens. You're telling your body, hey, I'm pregnant, store more fat, even if you're not pregnant. You know, you're basically, like I said before, you're bastardizing this natural process. And it's, 
it's never a good thing. I don't think it's, I don't think there's a time and place for kind of flipping these switches and tricking your body into storing more fat, you know? Or getting exogenous estrogens. I think it's a horrible idea, but it's so interesting. I mean, atrazine. So basically what we're talking about here is like you're saying, these grains that are stored in silos, whether it's corn, soy, or wheat, they get moldy. And in the U.S., there's no regulation for the amount of those mold estrogens. So these mycoestrogens that can be allowed in our food and even in our drinking water, right? So we are exposed to these in so many ways. And this kind of segues into these ideas of grass-fed versus grain-fed cattle. And one of the things that I've talked about is, you know, I want people, if they're going to do a carnivore diet or a whole foods animal-based diet, to get the best meat that they can. And not everybody can afford to eat grass-fed meat all the time. But one of the arguments for eating grass-fed meat, I believe, or grass-finished meat, might be that grain-fed meat is going to be fed grains that are moldy. And these cows are getting grains that are going to have, there's probably no regulation on the amount of mold on those grains or on the amount of mycoestrogens that those cows could be eating. And so one of the reasons that I that I choose to eat uh, grass finished meat exclusively is I want to avoid the toxins that these cows could potentially be accumulating from the grains that they're eating, whether it's glyphosate or atrazine or mycoestrogens. Um, as you've noted before, you know, we don't actually, it's hard to really say how much of this bioaccumulates in animals, but I'm pretty sure that it's bioaccumulating to some effect. What do you think about that? Do you right. think that's a reasonable right. strategy or people should think about that when they're considering grain fed versus grass fed meat? For sure. And I mean, I almost hate to say it because it sounds like bragging, but I bought a whole cow for $1,600. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, it was already butchered. I mean, dirt cheap compared, even compared to just regular conventional grocery store meat. Again, I know the farmer, you know, I have connections, but I used to raise cows actually. But I, when I buy bacon, I get it from Europe. You know, I make sure it's European imported bacon because I was interviewing a different farmer who raised pigs and he said, because the moldy grains will throw the pigs into estrus um, so early, what they did is they, they still feed them the moldy grains, but they would put in clay. They would throw on like bentonite clay to kind of bind up some of the estrogen. Um, you know, so <laughs> there's definitely an awareness that it causes health issues, but it, as long as they keep the dose low enough to not totally screw over the animal, the problem is it's transient, right? Like you've got these free range cows, they're out eating grass, and then they ship them over to these big CAFOs these big giant feedlots and they load them up with corn to get them all fat. And they have done studies on that corn. Uh, and of course it's full of atrazine and the cows that are eating that corn. So the, the standard feedlot cow, they did a blood serum uh, test and a urine test. And they found in the blood of those cows, they had 700,000 nanograms per liter of atrazine in their blood on average. Right? So obviously how much is ending up in the meat and how much is ending up in our bodies, it's probably pretty high. It's certainly higher than it should be when you've got 200 nanograms per liter changing male frogs into female frogs. Now, again, that's apples and oranges because frogs are sitting in the water and we're ingesting it. But even so, I mean, you want to minimize that in my mind. I would, I agree with you completely. I mean, I guard, you know, I guard my testosterone levels like, like yeah. I, I think about those all the time and I know this is relevant for both men and women because women can get too much estrogen and women can get not enough testosterone. I mean, women can become affected by these excess levels of estrogen as well. So, but I think the guys will particularly feel this in, you know, their nether regions when we're talking about these ideas with the meat. And so, yeah, that's the, that's one of the reasons. And then, you know, these, it's so interesting. You'll have to send me that study. Maybe I can link to it in the show notes where they looked at the corn Yep. The levels of atrazine, this, this pesticide, this herbicide that's sprayed on corn that then the cows are eating in these feedlots. And then, I mean, it's so high in their blood. It's got to be ending up in the muscles somewhat. And we've got to be yeah, getting some sure. of it. And we're talking about, you know, small levels in drinking water. Surely this is affecting us. And, you know, the, the overarching context here is, hey, we live in a toxic world. It's 2019. We're not going to be able to avoid everything. But if we can substantially decrease our exposures, we could really affect things. And I think that a lot of this, you start to see it like in terms of cumulative exposure, it is not hard to get a cumulative exposure to these things that is substantial and could really change our overall hormonal levels. I mean, that's striking. Yeah. They've done studies with paleontologists with bone structures. And I talk about this in my book, of course, because, uh, they can determine that uh, that testosterone has actually been dropping for thousands of years just because oh people started ingesting all these plants, right? Oh. And uh, 
and they, they, you know, there's like a more feminized facial bone structure in men, even like I say, thousands of years ago, but it's just become dramatically, dramatically changed in the last 20 years because of all the plastics and all these, you know, these chemicals. And, and the big one too, that we haven't even mentioned is personal care products because, you know, they're throwing in a lot of these, you know, lavender essential oils and even more phthalates and parabens. It's weird because phthalates are a plastic ingredient, but they put them into these fragrances and perfumes and shampoos, deodorants, you know, just because it's cheap filler, number one, but also according to scientists that I talk to, it carries the fragrance, fragrance farther in the air. So that's the justification. They say, oh, it, it carries it farther. So that's why we, in reality, it's just a cheap filler that they can get away with and they don't even have to put on the label. They can put it under the term fragrance. So they hide these chemicals on the personal care products. So we're getting bombarded from so many directions these days. And it's not no longer it's just the plants like it used to be thousands of years ago. Now it's 20 sources, right? That is so interesting. You'll have to send me that study about the, the paleoanthropology and the way that mm. we're changing because that is an interesting thing. The first couple of chapters of the book that I'm writing uh, are about sort of mm. our evolutionary history and our connections with meat eating and carnivore diets and how that made us human. It's so interesting to think that if we started eating plants during times of starvation that we were changing as people or that it could have had some feminizing effect on males. That yeah, is even- striking. They even have data on dogs that, that are, have been declining in testosterone. So oh my God. it's not just humans. <laughs> it's so scary. It's so scary. It makes me want to put my, my, my jewels in like a, like, a, <laughs> like a safe locker. I'm just like, I'm so scared. And I don't, I don't get overly scared. And I check my testosterone frequently. And I, I think yep. it's a great metric. You know, I've been using one of these like juve lights, one of these like near infrared lights, and I'm going to retest my testosterone. And I think there are so many things that could contribute, but that is striking. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about, I mean, I love that you highlighted the personal care products. I'll echo that and we can talk a little more about it for people. But I mean, at this point, I think it's crazy to think like we're getting this from all angles and we're talking soap, shampoo, you know, shaving creams, perfumes, fragrances, lotions, and what we're looking for, how do, so when people are looking for personal care products, I know on your website, you have a list of products that you think are better, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not exhaustive. It's just the ones that I use, but they're mm-hmm. relatively inexpensive compared to most. And I don't make any, I don't, I don't have like affiliations or anything. So right. I'm not biased. I just tell people, Hey, here's what I use. Cause I get asked almost every day. You know? Right. And I'll put the link in the show notes, but where can people go to see that list? It's ajconsultingcompany.com. Okay. Ter- terrible name, but that's what I came up with like 10 years ago. And I used to, I used to make viruses for the government. Um, I was like a government contractor. What? I, was, I was designing viruses and uh, yeah, off topic. Right. But it was, it was to knock down genes and study Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. But then they said, well, you got to have a, you got to have a company. So I just put down on the paper, AJ consulting companies threw it down. And now I kind of have to live with that. <laughs> so, that, so it's actually spelled out. It's AJ, AJ consulting, consulting company. company. Com. Com. Okay. <laughs> We're going to fix that for you. That's, that's impossible. <laughs> but anyway, I'll put it in the show notes. People can go there and see the stuff that Anthony uses. Yeah. Um, you know, personally, I, people laugh about this. I don't use hardly anything for personal care products. You know, one That's of the good. things that I've started doing is I just use rubbing alcohol. People always kind of laugh at this. I use rubbing alcohol as deodorant, which I think works really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I don't need to use anything there. I don't, I don't actually use anything on my face. Um, I mean, I'm a dude, I'm kind of a Neanderthal in general, but I don't even use shampoo on my hair anymore. I mean, I'm in the ocean so much and I just shower. I don't use it. But I mean, for most people, they want to use these things. That's fine. I've just said, Hey, I don't even need these things. It's so much easier, but there are products out there that are probably cleaner than others. And people yeah. can go to your website and look oh, at and, that. But I mean, I think, yeah. I feel like there's a business opportunity there with the carnivore community because people should start making tallow based products. We're going to. Okay, good. Because somebody sent me something, but then it, they said, Hey, I love your website. Let me send you my version of moisturizer. And it was based on beef tallow, but then they had lavender essential oil. So they obviously hadn't been paying attention to what I, what I write about and say, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, I'm working with a company in San Diego. I think we're going to develop like all sorts of products for carnivores and awesome. for people who are on animal based diets. And one of those is going to be probably fragrance free 
tallow based soaps and the animal based soaps. I mean, this is a little bit of fight club, you know, it's like getting back to the idea of like, I think that animal based soaps could be very, very, very useful for people and very nice and not have all these sort of synthetic right. pesticides, phthalates, plastics and stuff. So yeah, that's coming in the future too. Nice. But nice. yeah, but I think, you know, people should go there and think about it. You know, it's the lotion you're putting on your face. It's the lotion you're putting on your hands. It's the, oh, yeah. the perfume that you're using. It's your deodorant. It's the water you're showering in. And I mean, that's the other thing that we didn't talk about with water is I think it's a very good investment for people to put a filter on their shower. And you can get these sort of carbon filters for your shower as well, because when you're showering, you're going to be exposed to a lot of water and you can absorb it that way too. Do you think that that's true? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so much that it's true. I have a whole house filter, a carbon filter on my whole mm -hmm. house because I've got kids. I've got four kids and I don't want them bathing, you know, just sitting in the bathtub. Of course, kids are always drinking the water in the tub and things like that, you know. And so I'm, yeah, I'm totally in agreement. Yeah. And it's pretty cheap to get a, fa a shower filter that's carbon based and that will mitigate some exposure there. But I think that's awesome for people to think about like all the ways we're getting exposed to this. And honestly, like in my history, like when I have, you know, been around people who had strong fragrances or lotions, I just, I was, I just can't even do, it just bothers me so much. I don't yeah, even want to be same around here. it. Well, it's funny because people think it washes out, right? But in reality, these, these chemicals prefer to cling onto your skin. And it's similar when you put them through the laundry. You've got to be really careful with your laundry detergent because when we go to our in-laws, they just use the standard, or they used uh -huh. to use. Now they've kind of started to change because they finally are getting, catching on to this. But they used to use just the Tide and all these brand name things. And every once in a while, we'd do our laundry over there. And our clothing, literally, it would take like, like two or three wash cycles back at my house with scent free, fragrance free, seventh generation laundry detergent to get that smell out. It would last cycle after cycle of fragrance free to get it out. I mean, it's amazing how much they cling into your clothing. It's horrible. I mean, I go to other, like I go to like Airbnbs now and I'm traveling and I think, oh, this is so, this smells so chemically. I hate it. It's so hard. Yeah, yeah I do the same thing. Uh, people will be happy to know that I do wash my clothes. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> well, a I, I have one trick for people as I pack when I go traveling to, you know, paleo FX or whatever, I bring pillowcases. I bring two pillowcases and at the hotel, I put them over the hotel pillowcases. So at least I'm not like sleeping all night with these fragrance chemicals just blasting into my face. I figure the sheets, you know, whatever, but the pillowcase, at least I do travel with. That's a great idea. I love that. That's really cool. And I mean, people can always travel with small amounts of you know, personal care products that are not full of these things either. But yeah, the things that you're washing your clothes in can even be a source of this. So man, people are getting it from all angles. So yeah. just to like recap, and then we'll dive into the part that everybody is probably begging for now, which is how do we, how do we mitigate this or can we detox from these? Mm -hmm. So we talked about water, drinking water, showering water, and the fact that, you know, there are, uh, you know, contraceptives in the water supply that are going to affect this and that we should be thinking about carbon filters. We talked about it coming from plastics, plastic water bottles, plastic cans. Um, we talked about it coming from food and specific sources of food. We talked about it coming from moldy grains. We talked about it coming from personal care products. Did we leave anything out? I think that's the majority of it other than like sunscreen maybe. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about sunscreen. And then the other thing that I want to highlight for people, and this is kind of unavoidable is when you get in a car, you know, that new car mm. smell and like all of those yeah. chemicals in the new car. It's, that's, yep. I guess that's kind of, that's pretty well, similar, even, but no, it's exactly. And they've done studies and those are benzophenones. Those are actually sunscreen chemicals to protect the plastic from sun breakdown. And they've done studies on even a child daycare facility in California. They did a study because they have these like plastic floors, you know, where they're like the rubber mat floors and then plastic toys everywhere. And they showed that um, the, the amount of benzophenone and phthalates, the amounts of these sunscreen chemicals and these plastic chemicals just in the air for breathing exceeded can cancer benchmarks. And by the way, breast cancer is up 250% since 1980 specifically because of these, can these, these, these chemicals we're talking about, these estrogen mimicking chemicals. It's not because we're not raising enough awareness of breast cancer. It's because we're ingesting all these chemicals, which is, you know, it reminds me of Bill Burr. He has this joke, this comedian Bill Burr. He says, basically, we're dressing up our football players like newborn baby girls, you know, in the NFL. And nobody's actually avoiding the chemicals that are causing them, right? It's just, just raising awareness. 
So even, and by the way, like to, to exceed cancer benchmarks for children in these daycare facilities, I mean, that takes a lot of these chemicals, you know, it's because cancer is probably the least of my concern. I'm more worried about the more subtle things, the long-term impacts, because usually these things are not super carcinogenic, you know, they're, but sometimes they are. Obviously, if you get enough of them, they are. But I'm more worried about the more subtle long-term things. And in terms of just the sunscreen itself, the pure sunscreen that people are rubbing, you don't have to get the conventional sunscreen. You can get zinc sunscreen or you can use a peptide called uh, melanotan, melanotan 2, and inject this peptide and that turns your skin tan um, if you really want to <laughs> be a biohacker. But, um, but zinc sunscreen without any crap in it, without any weird chemical ingredients, just 20% zinc, you know, that's super effective for me. And I've got some good brands on my website for that too, just that, so that it doesn't turn your skin super white. Some of them turn your skin really white, like a ghost. And honestly, I, you, you can find ones that don't do that, but at least it's better than putting chemicals on, you know, if you have to choose between those two. I feel the same way. I wear it with pride. When I go surfing, I have like full white face and I don't care. And if you, even it's funny, even if you look at professional surfers, they just, I mean, I see guys in the lineup all the time who are full white face. Like they don't care. <laughs> they just, they're like, whatever, this is my, this is my badge of courage. Like they're out there. They don't give a, awesome. they don't give a, they don't give a flip about, you know, how their skin looks. So that's important. But yeah, I agree about the sunscreen. I've never liked conventional sunscreens. I would caution people against sunscreen strongly. And again, this is the idea that everything that you buy, everything that you put on your body, everything that you ingest, you need to be aware. Like there are probably phthalates and estrogenic compounds in these substances, unless we are very careful. I particularly use the Badger brand of sunscreen. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah, I, I like the ingredients, but I still get burned. I'm super, super white. And it's, it's got 20% zinc, but I still get burned with that one for some huh. reason. Okay. I, I have used it. I've tested like 10 of them. I've, te I've spent so much money testing these products. It's better than nothing, but I still do get some sunburn. And again, that one turns your skin really white. It does. It does. I love it. I just, I love it. I wear it with pride. I'm just like a white guy. I usually nope. wear a sun shirt too, by the way, just like this. When I go fishing, I wear a sun shirt now. That's a smart idea. That's totally a smart idea. I've got the gloves and I got this goofy hat that has like ear flaps that go down over your neck. I have the whole ensemble. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. I have a good friend in San Diego who's also fair skinned. And what I tell him is, you know, people that are fair skinned are just incredibly efficient sun harvesters. And, and the advantage that you guys have is that you're going to make vitamin D and all the other good stuff you get from the sun very efficiently. So sure. I've talked about this in the past, but when we are exposed to UV light, we get all sorts of good things beyond the vitamin D we get right. endorphins, we get nitric oxide, we get cholesterol sulfate. And so nope. people that are fair skinned can take solace or can be proud of the fact that you're going to make all that stuff really well. I'm a little more dark skin. My ancestry is primarily Italian. So I need to be somewhere that has a good amount of sun to get the stuff that I need. I'm not as efficient, but I also don't burn as much either. So it's a, it's a give and take. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a total give and take. So at this point, you know, people are just, I'm sure feeling just estrogen poison there. I'm sure most <laughs> people listening to this, whether they're men or women are, are reaching for their, their precious parts and thinking, oh my gosh, how much is the estrogen affecting these parts of my body? Am I just a frog sitting in a bath of atrazine right now? And unfortunately, the answer for a lot of us is somewhat. So what do we do? You've talked about this before. Like, I know there are some strategies that people can use. I think the first strategy is avoid exposure. Yeah. You know, think about the food you're eating. Like you said, don't use lavender essential oil. Don't eat soy. Don't eat flax. Don't eat flavonoids. Or flav you know, don't eat those kind of foods or don't eat the supplements that are containing them. Don't do resveratrol. Think about these things. Be careful with your water. Be aware of the personal care products. But even beyond that, what, what can we do to sort of get rid of these or, or clean our yeah. bodies out? Yeah. Um, the average lifespan of a fat cell, they've done studies with people that were, uh, exposed to the, the atomic bomb, so radioactive materials, and they found that the average life of a fat cell is a year and a half, the average cell. And they can live up to 10 years. You can have a fat cell that, that lasts in your body up to 10 years. Damn, fat cells live in 10 years. <laughs> I know. Die! And, yeah. And, and of course, these estrogen chemicals, because they're storing inside those fat cells and they're flipping on the switch saying, hey, store more fat, store more fat. You know, you want to get them out of the fat cell. By far, the best way to do it is to use a sauna. 
So I think that's one of the reasons saunas have so many ubiquitous benefits is because they're getting so many of these chemicals out of our fat and they've done studies. They've done like nicotine patches, but without the nicotine. And then they, they just have people go into saunas or groups of people that don't go in the saunas and they test the chemicals that are on those patches from our sweat that we're sweating out. And they find phthalates and BPA and all these nasty chemicals. We're sweating these out. So not only is it speeding up the molecular motion and helping these chemicals, you know, exit the fat cells, get into our blood, clear out through our urine, they're physically sweating out. That's the biggest thing. I mean, that's by far the biggest. I think Mm -hmm. avoid it, get in the sauna, and you're, you know, you should be good. Mm -hmm. I love that. I don't don't think there's like products people need to go out and buy for detoxing or anything else. No, as long as they're avoiding, as long as people are avoiding. Avoid it, drink good water, and then get in the sauna, I think is a great thing. And is there any research about infrared saunas versus dry saunas? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, in terms of, in terms of the sweating and all that, obviously you need enough heat. I love infrared because it's, it obviously acts in a different way than just a heat sauna. It has all kinds of additional benefits, but you need the heat as well, um, at least for the detox portion, like the sweating and moving molecular motion, speeding up molecular motion. Um, so, you know, infrared has a ton of benefits. It increases BDNF. It goes through your skull three inches. They've done cadaver studies. I personally studied the juve light at the Mayo Clinic. You know, I, I bring it in, study stem cell changes on the epigenetics. I do long cell research with the stem, uh, with the juve light. So I have a lot of familiarity with the infrared and it has a ton of interesting benefits, nitric oxide, it increases something called VEGF7. Like there's a bunch of VEGFs and one of them is called vascular endothelial growth factor number seven, which improves your lungs. So I, I managed to get funding to look at the lungs and asthma with the juve light. Um, so the, you know, the, the infrared has a whole host of additional benefits, including testosterone increases by the way. So I, I like it when people can just kill two birds with one stone and kind of use an infrared sauna that also has heat, you know, has enough heat, but use whatever you can. I think they're both winners. Yeah, I've, I've started using my Juve Light in the last couple of months, like I said in the beginning, and I'm going to be retesting my testosterone. The mechanisms around the near infrared are pretty fascinating for me. I met those guys when I was at Paleo FX. They're such good guys. I'm yep. excited to be down in San Diego and close to them in San Clemente. But I mean, if people are wondering how we use the Juve Light for testosterone, it's exactly what you're thinking. I mean, I put it on my testicles and, you know, like yeah. I put, I mean, and I believe they've done studies in rats where they expose rat testicles to this near infrared light, 830 nanometers, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's been shown to potentially increase mitochondrial function, possibly through cytochrome C oxidase. Am I yeah. thinking about that properly? Exactly. It releases nitric oxide from cytochrome C oxidase. And that basically allows your body to make more ATP, which amps up the light egg cells. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it does so many things. It's almost hard to believe it, it helps regenerate joint tissue and vascular flow into the joints, you know? So there's specific genes. When I do DNA consulting, I'm looking at nitric oxide genes and some other genes that are relating to that because certain people are high responders to infrared and certain people it's kind of like, eh. like for me, I get paresthesia from infrared. So I, I don't know if if you've ever taken the supplement beta alanine, yeah, like, especially if you take a lot of it, you'll know what paresthesia is. It's like when your, your skin feels like super itchy and tingly and Mm -hmm. crawly. It's not a good feeling. Um, if you have a real high dose of beta alanine or something. I've never taken it. Yeah. But, but I get that same response from the juve light. If I sit on it for more than like 10 or 15 minutes uh-huh. directly on my skin, I get the paresthesia because the nitric oxide is being released. Whereas my wife, she can sit on that thing for 20 minutes and not get that same response. Now, the thing is, is even if you know, you're not a high responder like I am where you can feel it, I don't think people should overdo it. You have to be careful not to overcook yourself. It's just like training or anything else. You can overtrain. You can, you know, you can work out too much. You can sit in the sauna too long or whatever. You can overdo it. And it's easier to overdo it with the juve if you don't feel it, you know, but for somebody like me, I feel it. So so it's easy to stop because I know, okay, that's getting a little uncomfortable. Well, I love this. You know, I talked to those guys uh, when I was in Southern California and when I met them at Paleo FX and it's just an interesting idea kind of hearkening back to these ancestral health ideas that we probably were exposed to near infrared light at morning and at night. And it's something that we've all lost because 
we are inside and morning at, and at, I should say sunrise and sunset rather than morning and night. But sunrise and sunset is when there's the most near infrared light, if I'm thinking about that properly. And so right. we're sort of, we're missing all these benefits. We're missing the ultraviolet light during the day, but we're also missing the near infrared and the other infrared wavelengths in the morning and in the evening. So basically throughout the day, I mean, you know, Jack Cruz is doing a little happy dance. Is He's not listening to this, but you know, like people that are into light are, are just, you know, they're excited yeah. when they hear this. And I would agree with them to some extent that the light, different wavelengths of light are very valuable for humans. And none of us are outside all day. And very few of us are outside all day on any single day of the year. And so I, I like that the juve light can kind of provide a little bit of uh, restoration of that circadian pattern in terms of light, you know, near infrared in the morning and right. then ultraviolet during the day when I go outside and then I use it again at night. But I'm curious from your perspective, what do you think is an optimal dose of the near infrared, uh, like the juve? Well, it depends. Yeah, I like the juve because I know how much, how many joules it puts out and all this. Like they, they've done a good job of quantifying exactly the power. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these infrared lights, they're not powerful enough to even, you know, get through your fat cells and get into your body very far. Um, but usually I say like 10 to 20 minutes, somewhere in that range. But Per day? Yeah, but you know, it depends because some of the juve lights are real small and people just put them like 10 minutes on one joint and then you have to shift it over to the next joint or whatever your target area has on, have it on your head. And I mean, the sleep thing is, is something I'm glad you brought up because Ben Pakulski, a friend of mine, Ben Pakulski, like phenomenal bodybuilder and bodybuilder trainer, he, uh, he kind of happened upon, you know, with his aura ring, he discovered that basically if he used that juve in the evening, it dramatically improves his sleep. And that's something nobody knows. There's like, there's no publications on it or anything, but it, it's really dramatic. And he, he makes all his clients have an aura ring. And then he has a juve light sauna, like a full sauna with the juve lights everywhere. I've been in it down in Florida. And he, a lot of other people are getting the same exact, they're replicating his finding. And so I've been talking to the Scott Nelson and the guys at Juve about doing some kind of a clinical study where we basically just get it down on paper that, hey, this is also a benefit. You're improving your deep sleep cycles. I'd talked to them about that when I was hanging out with them in Southern California. Mm. They were mentioning the same thing. And that was why I started using it morning and night. Yeah. Um, and we'll see. I mean, I think that ideally I would use it for 10 minutes in the morning and then 10 minutes at night. Yep. So, and, that, and that is a circadian pattern. That's an evolutionary thing that could be... Yep. Um, completely consistent. So, oh man, that's crazy. We went way off the topic of estrogen, but <laughs> I, 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 I'm glad that we could. I'm glad that we could talk about the near infrared stuff. It's super cool, and it's kind of connected with sauna and detox. Well, yeah, and, I think and let me make the full loop because the reason I started, I started uh, studying infrared at the Mayo Clinic, was because I was pulling out fat cells from human fat, uh, from stem cells, excuse me, from human fat cells. So I was doing these adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cell studies, and I was shining infrared on them to reprogram the epigenetics. So basically, we have DNA, but on top of the DNA, we have, I know you know this, but I'm just saying this for your audience, we have marks on top of the DNA. And you can change those marks. The DNA doesn't really change, but the marks on top of the DNA get changed. And what's interesting about that is that gets passed to the next generation. And this is really huge in science right now. I mean, most lay people don't understand how big that is the discovery of epigenetics and the inheritance of changeable health issues right or benefits you can improve your health and pass that on you can screw up your health with these estrogen chemicals especially and pass that on and that's kind of the culmination of these estrogen chemicals the problem with them the biggest problem is that they change your epigenetics you know estrogen it goes into the cell it goes through the membrane of a cell but it also goes through the nuclear membrane. Most people don't realize, you know, that most chemicals don't go into the nucleus because the DNA is actually surrounded by its own membrane that's even more kind of stringent. And, but estrogen goes in there. It goes into the nucleus. It goes and interacts with DNA. And so do these estrogen chemicals because they're changing epigenetic marks and they're causing infertility in future generations. They're causing a lot of health problems that get passed on. And it actually goes out to four generations. They've done studies in mice at least four generations. I mean, it gets expensive when you start going much further than that. But Michael Skinner, scientist out in Washington, he's got data on four generations, which is unbelievable because a lot of scientists, they used to say, well, the mother is exposed. Like you can give a, a mother mouse BPA exposure, just one exposure, just boom, hit her with BPA in her drinking water and then remove it from the drinking water. And that will affect three generations. They, they've done these studies. And then the scientists said, 
well, that's because the mother is exposed, but then the fetus in the womb is exposed at the same time. And so are the gametes, right? The stem cells from the fetus are there, so they're exposed. But then Michael Skinner went on to do that same study and show the fourth generation is also effective just from that one exposure of BPA. Not even every day like we're getting it. We're just hitting them once, you know, and we're seeing a fourth generation impact. You know, I was talking with my friend Tommy Wood up here the other day, and he was talking about EMFs and you know, we'll see where this conversation goes. But, you know, it was the same sort of thing. He said that there were a couple of conflicting studies, but one of the studies that he had seen, and again, and these were in mice or rodents, that said that when the rodents were raised near like equivalents of power lines, it took a few generations to see the effects mm, yeah. of the exposure to EMF. But then he said there were some studies that repeated it that didn't necessarily show that. So the reason I bring that up is I worry, you know, our generation is probably one of the first generations to have major exposure to BPA and these, and these chemicals. Because, you know, when I was a kid, there wasn't a whole lot of plastic water bottles. There were a little bit, you know, but the generation before us, not a ton. I mean, our parents, yeah. maybe not a ton. Even, like, even, I, the, even the soda bottles, they used to make soda cans, like Coca-Cola used to make them with steel. They wouldn't coat them with plastic. And then people complained about the steel taste, like the metal, metallic taste, because it was made from stainless steel or, or steel, you know, before they did aluminum. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So I think that we're only, I mean, you know, you have kids and so it's probably the next couple of generations are really going to be the generations that are going to be affected by this the most. And, you know, I love the title of your book, Astro Generation, you know, and I'll link to that in the show notes as well. But it's true. I think that what I'm most afraid of is our, the following generations after us. I mean, I want to live a life with robust testosterone and I want women to be able to avoid excess estrogens, but I think it's the gen the kids now right. that are going to be in real trouble. And I think we're going to see testosterone levels decline. I think we're going to see women with abnormal estrogen levels and then their children. I mean, between yeah. that and the exposure to EMFs, which is something we don't think we fully understand yet. I worry that, I mean, this could be the end, you know, like we, I think we could really see some yeah. major problems in terms of future generations of humans, in terms of fertility levels right. of testosterone, Right. you know, feminization, inadequate androgeniz androgenization. And I mean, it's a scary, nope. it's nope. a scary world. And yeah. people really yeah, puberty. Be I mean, girls are already going into puberty at like age eight and things. And it's becoming so common. I've read medical journal articles and I quote them in my book where doctors are no longer considering that abnormal because they see it so often and they're trying to redefine the normal just like they redefine the age or the, the range for testosterone because it's gotten so low they can if you go in there with super low testosterone they consider that normal now they won't even flag it but the similar with the puberty they're trying to redefine the normal range of puberty because it's so common now that they see it at a young age and they don't really understand why because people most of these doctors and these scientists are pretty narrow-minded and they're not they're not looking at the big picture. They don't understand the effects of these estrogen chemicals. So they just kind of considered an anomaly. And it's, it's a huge problem. The other problem with feminization, switching over to the boys, in, at least in animal studies, when you start feminizing these animals, these males with chemicals, you see apathy. You see just total indifference where they just don't have any motivation. Uh, that's another one that's super common on the other, on the other side. Jeez. And so I love what you said earlier about kids and daycares and for parents to be aware that like if their kids are playing with plastic toys and chewing other, on them, yeah, yeah, chewing on them. And the other thing that I, we didn't even talk about is carpets and indoor environments, right? There are chemicals, right. these flame retardants from carpets and yeah, um, those can be estrogenic too, right? It's just, yeah, the it's plastic everywhere. carpets, oh, the, mm -hmm. linoleum, the linoleums are particularly bad about off gassing plastic chemicals into the environment, you know, so uh, it's better to use tile floor, wood floor or something. I'm going most to live the, in the woods. Most of the wood floor isn't really wood. It's fake plastic wood that looks like wood. wood. <laughs> That's it. Okay, everybody. This yeah. is my last podcast. I'm going to be living in the woods and hunting animals. <laughs> You'll never see me again. Oh, Anthony's going to see me in his backyard. I'm going to be hunting animals. Yeah. I'm done. I'm done. I need to just go sit in a sauna for the rest of my life. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I love it. I, I think that you know, listening to this and thinking more about it and also thinking about heavy metals, which we don't have time to talk about today. I'm, I'm going to continue to make sauna, whether it's infrared or dry sauna, a part of my daily practice, probably in perpetuity. And I would encourage people to try and access that mm -hmm. um, because it's just, it's a great tool for detoxification or at least some sort of sweating. Uh, yep. If you don't live in a hot environment, you know, you need to sweat every day. We don't have to go to sauna, but for right. a lot of us, it's the best way to sweat 
uh, and may mobilize chemicals in a unique way. So that's awesome. So anything else you want to leave people with before we wrap up? This has been a really awesome conversation. I think a lot of people are going to get so much out of this one. Yeah. Well, I think the final thing would be that in my book, I offer three different plans. It's like a gold, a silver, and a bronze plan because some people are on a budget, some people are in college, whatever, and they can't go super extreme and start ripping out their carpet. But then some people are, you know, some people are pro athletes or whatever, and they should follow that quote unquote gold plan. So there's like some really big ones that everyone should be doing, like filtering your drinking water and just avoiding plastic when you have the option between plastic or glass or things like that. There's some really almost no brainer things. Um, but because there's been previously, there's been absolutely no awareness, you know, like those quote unquote, no brainer things. Most people are just following along and doing those no brainer things in a bad way. So anyways, gold, silver, bronze, hopefully that helps people to kind of simplify a little bit. Yeah. And I'll link to that in the show notes. I will link to your book. I'll link to your consulting company because you have links on your, your website and you see clients for consulting as well, right? Every day. Yeah. Okay. And they can find you through the website. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And then I'll link to the juve light for people and I will link to a bunch of other cool stuff. Maybe some of the studies we talked about. And so where, where, what are your other social media spots? Tell people where they can find you. We talked about AJ consulting company, which we're going to have to (laughs) (laughs) rebrand. Where else can people find you? Yeah. I mean, I'm mostly, I, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, but I mostly use Instagram. Uh huh. And what's your just handle my, there? It's just my name, Anthony G J. Anthony G J. What's the G stand for? That's my middle name, George. But uh, it's funny when when I was on I was on this comedian's podcast and he introduced me as Anthony G as in girl J is the estrogen guy, <laughs> <laughs> like G as in girl. So uh, you know, it's easy to remember, I guess. Anthony G J on Instagram and on Twitter, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. And they can go to your website ajconsultingcompany.com. They can check out your book, Estra Generation. Man, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Paul. I, I just, I'm going to go get in a sauna right now. And like, <laughs> I'm just think, I'm looking around just, and I'm like, okay, what am I sitting on that is going to be estrogenic? Oh, well, let me ask you this. So I'm wearing a shirt by Lululemon, right? Like what about like synthetics oh, yeah, in our true. clothes? Yeah, is that going to, yeah. should I just rip this shirt off right now? <laughs> like the Incredible I, Hulk? I don't know because there's not a lot of, there are studies about laundry detergents and dryer sheets and how the, the, the fragrances from those do physically go into your skin. They haven't done studies that I've seen on polyester clothing, but I do try and avoid it. If I have a choice between cotton and polyester, I definitely choose the cotton stuff. Okay, um, man, if my but Lululemon. That's, but that's just one of those things that I don't have any evidence for, so I wouldn't get too worked up about it. I'll just, I'll just have to sit in the sauna extra long today. Well, thanks for being on, man. I'm sure we'll talk soon, and I think people are going to really enjoy this. So check out Anthony's stuff, and you guys stay radical.